Well, build my gallows and build them high Makes a long time climbing before I die I want the chance to spit in his eye well, he gave me balls, but I can see between To a dusty yard and a long gone green They call that freedom, if you know what I mean And I drown my sorrows, but the whiskey's gone I'm sober as good Hello everybody, welcome to the Long Bangers This is episode 156 I'm Matty, joined tonight by uh, John and Colin And guest star Grant Stott uh, Grant Stott, how are you? How are you doing today? Uh, very good, thank you. Uh, Sunday night, as it is when we're recording this, and I've just driven to York and back uh, to pick up my daughter. She's finished university there, and um, uh, I didn't know what the roads were going to be like this week with the train strikes, so decided to bite the bullet, left the house at nine o'clock, flo- four hours to get down, an hour to pack the car, and four hours back. Uh, I'm ready for a glass of wine. Happy Father's Day. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> that's that's exactly that's- it. That's usually how my uh, weekends go, just spend it in the car. Uh, right. Co- Colin, how are you? How are you doing? Good, mate. Hi. Not bad. Had a nice relaxing weekend. So, not too bad. Are you looking very relaxed, to be fair? No, thanks. Aye. because I'm going on the chair. Aye. <laughs> go for the Tony Soprano look today. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, John, how are you doing? Hi, pretty good, thanks. Quite keen to know, for Grant, what car snacks he took when he was four hours down the road and then four hours back well i'll tell you what i have i have i have one car snack and i have a steady supply of car snack and <laughs> it is um cherry lips remember cherry lips and floral gums from back in the day um uh, a few years ago i was at a, a 50th birthday party this is a long story for a car snack but they had cherry lips and i was like i haven't had these since i was a teenager and you went on amazon and right enough, but it was in a jar, right? So I've had to like buy a year's supply of cherry lips. <laughs> so what I do is I just have a wee plastic container in my car and I've got cherry lips that keep me going in the mood. So yeah, that is my in-car snack of choice. Thanks for asking. Yeah, cherry lips are, if I remember, they're shaped like little lips. So do, you, do you ever care if you're stuck in traffic, just put, a, put them at the front of your lip and just look at the car next to you? <laughs> <laughs> That's exactly <laughs> <laughs> Still as tasty as I remember them too. They're brilliant. Good stuff. Um, I don't know, Grant, if you've ever heard the podcast. We're presuming not because you agreed to come on to it, um, <laughs> <laughs> which, which is usually what happens. Uh, we, we do two, well, we do more than two, but the two main ones, we do long bangers, which we're recording just now, which is generally about the and then uh, short bangers, which is uh, nonsense. People send us questions and uh, about any topic and we try to answer them. Um, and we thought, just to kind of get us uh, warmed up and into the show, we would start with a question that uh, Fatis Prickus has sent in. Fatis Prickus, of course, um, suggested you as a guest on a tweet we sent out last week, which is how we ended up in, uh, here. Um, so you have him to blame, stroke, thank. Um, clear uh, throat. Uh, yes, clear <laughs> throat. <laughs> um, so uh, Fatis Prickus is, or Alex, to give us his, his proper name, and he did say, say hello as well. His question is, did a swan start the rumour that they could break a human's arm because they've seen a human swanning around the place and were pissed off at the bad job they were doing of it. I think that is a perfectly acceptable explanation as to why it happened, especially if they were uh, swore about Arthur's seat uh, because lots of folk give it a bit of swagger when they're uh, walking <laughs> around that place because they've just done a massive walk, obviously, or a run. Uh, so maybe it was a runner or a cyclist uh, or... Oh, yeah, better, better edit out the cyclist. I, 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 have a pop I, I did that once. I, I, I had a pop at cyclist once on Twitter, and I lived to regret that. So I never, I never have a pop at cyclists. That's one of my golden rules on Twitter. Don't talk about uh, politics. Don't talk about usually football, and don't talk about cyclists because it rarely ends well. Um. I don't so think that's we've. From, that's right. That, that's that, that's ten, tends to be how we go. I don't think we've had any run-ins with cyclists on the podcast yet, have we? So yet, I'm not inviting it. Uh, I think no, maybe one of our subscribers is a is a cyclist, so definitely can I offend that community? Yeah, I. I would never do <laughs> such a thing. <laughs> um, so. Um, John, did you have another question you were going to ask about the uh, We're On Our Way DVD? If you remember doing that, Grant, we were kind of joking before we started about things that we remembered uh, you doing that, that you might not have the same recollection of. Mm-hmm. 
So I remember Tony Mowbray came in after Williamson, if I remember correctly, and Hibs had a good season under Mowbray. We qualified for Europe. And then after that, Grant, I think you did that. We're on our way video DVD. I don't know if we were still doing VHS at the time, but it certainly was out on DVD. And I wondered, so I don't think we finished third again until Jack Ross. Is that right? Mm -hmm. I think that's right, yeah. Would... Was there ever any opportunity to do anything like that then? Because obviously there'd been a big gap between Hibs finishing okay. third under Mowbray and then under Jack Ross. And I wonder if that maybe, I wonder if the fact that COVID, uh, people not being able to go to the games kind of led into the idea that the football was boring. I don't know. I think, I think that, I mean, my relationship with the club was entirely different back then. I had a lot closer relationship with the club, and I had a lot more opportunities to do things, and um, and I and, and I was actually pushing for, you know, Hibs to get a camera and a microphone and do you know more TV and what's turned what is now obviously, and everybody's every football club is doing it is Hibs TV, and um, uh, I was saying you know it's so easy now you know, the internet is there and you know get a camera put a microphone on it and start doing interviews and getting you know getting out on onto the website and things. Um, and part, and that led to a conversation about doing a, a a DVD at the end of of that season. And I'd never done anything before. I never sort of produced and uh, written anything like that before. But um, it was a, it was a wonderful opportunity. And I got my mate Justin, who who runs Early Media, and and I worked with Justin at the BBC, and he set up his own pr- um, private company. And he was brilliant with me. And he says, look, he says, let let's do it. Let's make a let's let's make a DVD. And you know, we managed to get all the rights. Of you know that was a great learning curve because I never done anything. I just I stuck my limit. Yeah, I'll do it. Um, so I kind of took the whole thing on it, and it was a massive undertaking as it turned out. And um, it, it took forever. We worked it in the night to cut everything together and, and do. And then we had to do all the interviews as well. And um, and then we had to get into things like uh, permission because we used teenage kicks at that time. That was obviously the time that the teenage kicks was was big for us in the back of John Peel. Dying, and we played that at one of the matches around about that time. I, I, I'm forgetting my years, but it was certainly around about that era. And we just kind of adopted it because we obviously had that that young team mm. coming through. So teenage kicks kind of became our sort of unofficial wee anthem. And so, of course, I'm going to use it on the on the DVD. And we're we're in production, and, and of course we're we're layering all these bits of music with teenage kicks and things like that. And then Justin's going, so so I take it you got permission from the undertones to do this, have you? Um, just give me a wee uh, minute, just, just I just need to make a wee, <laughs> <laughs> a wee vocal. I'm going, Fuck. Um, why? There's one thing I hadn't thought of was was getting permission to use the track because obviously you're using it on a commercial product, which is the DVD. Uh, and so I ended up sort of contacting pals at Fourth, where I was working at the time. Who should I speak to? And then I spoke to the publishers and sent an email to the publisher. And, I, and to this day, we never got a reply. I sent a. a uh, 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 an official request to the the record company and the publishers who've got the rights to the song, <laughs> and they never gave us. So I've I've always lived by the uh, the adage, uh, seek uh, forgiveness, not permission. And uh, if you ever find yourself in bother, just go. Oh, sorry, gosh, I didn't mean that. <laughs> um, so I'm still waiting for um, for Fergal Sharkey to to come knocking at my door to to ask. For the royalties for that, but I didn't get any. I didn't get any. I certainly didn't make any money out of that DVD. That's for sure. So how does um, it really how does it work do it. with the the music? If if they don't say no, is that kind of permission? I I just yeah. Well, I mean, they had not give me guidance one way or the other. So we just went. Look, but, let's but, just press on and, and wait, and, and we'll assume they're just going to say yes, and we'll have to pay them whatever you know the publishing rights or what the the, the PRS uh, deem is uh, is appropriate. Um, but as I say to this day, it's uh, it's it's never come back to bite me on the backside. But I, I love that whole experience. Actually, as I say, it was, it was a learning curve for me, and I'd, I'd obviously done a lot of telly up, up to that point, so I had a good idea. I could visualise how I wanted it to go. And, uh, and I remember on Hibs.net one time. Oh God! And uh, I mean, it's so t- it's typical, you know. You you want your bollocks off for something, and and you know the, the reaction to it was really lovely. But I remember there was this one comment on I think it was Hibs.net. That said, I've been watching that uh, Tony Mowbray DVD that Hibs have put out, and they're just using the same crowd here every time there's a goal. <laughs> they did. <laughs> <laughs> we did, right? <laughs> and it's like, yes, we did because, oh, fuck it. It's because we we're just so busy, right? We just kept, you know, every time there's a goal, yeah. just cut and paste, put that and put that on, and we're doing that. And it's like, is that all you got to say? I've been there for weeks on this fucking thing. And all you're fucking mothering 
but it's because I need the same gear for the Hibs fans, just because it made my life a little bit easier. Just mute uh, it then, just mute it. <laughs> <laughs> I get it, because obviously there's a lot of goals, and uh, maybe it got on uh, folks' nerves that were hearing the same cheer, but um, yeah, it was, it was a great lyric of um, but no, it wasn't that would never, Jack Ross that would never went well down the, the, the Jack Ross one, would it? Because so that, that was dead exciting that season, all the goals, and the you know, they scored loads of goals as well. But there's the Jack Ross season, there was no crowds, so it would have been the same crowds, <laughs> yeah. Time. And but, but the expectations have changed, and it, it's like third isn't good enough anymore, thirds except in failure, and all that. You know, there's like a been a bit of mood like swing on it for whatever reason yeah, was, that is, I don't know. Yeah, but also, we'd also had those bloody horrendous Hamden experiences yeah. as well at that point, which, despite, you know, reaching, you know, finishing third is is absolutely uh, where we should be and what we should be achieving uh, if, every season. So, yeah, I get that. But uh, I think the kind of, it was all because of what Hamden, Hamden. And, uh, you know, the, the wind was taken right out of our sails at, at that point. And, um, I remember I did the. It was an online player of the year, and uh, they they asked me to do it online from from Hibs, and I had to pre-record an interview with Jack Ross. <laughs> I remember speaking to him and saying, "Jack, I've got to ask you about uh, St Johnston. How, how can we no beat St Johnston? <laughs> they beat us. They beat us three or four times or something, one nil, the same way every time. It's like, how can we know? How can we not see this coming? And um, you know, he gave me a, an answer, a short shift. He says, "Well, we did change it. We tied two up front and did all that." Um, but yeah, it was all kind of God. It was yeah. more just scunnered, you know. So um, yeah, it was. It, had we been a bit more successful at that, so sort of, in those final moments of, of those games, then I think there definitely would have been a DVD at the time. I think it's for the for Europe. Hampton. What was that? Sorry, Matt. I see we're out of Europe that quick. The following season, the DVD would have been called We're On Our Way Back. <laughs> <laughs> but I tell you, on the subject of DVDs and, 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 and on a Hibs uh, theme, uh, Jim Matthews' Time for Heroes DVD, I think, has to be one of the greatest, not just a Hibs footballing DVD and story, but I think a footballing mm -hmm. DVD. It's, it was just fantastic. I can watch that obviously, uh, often. But uh, Jim did such a fantastic job of that. The next one, you know, that whatever, that maybe that's why they didn't do one when we finished third, because that was, that, that, hip, the hips, the Time for Heroes, uh, one that Jim Matthews did for the Scottish Cup final is, that's, that's going to take some beating. Uh, it was such a brilliant, brilliant film uh, and uh, gets me every time. Brilliant. Colin, do you have a question? No, not really. I was just going to say, um, the Mowbray season we did get put out of the Scottish Cup semi-final that year as well but I suppose it wasn't the final which is where the deflation came in wasn't it Aye. I don't know it linger, linger on it too long no we'll move we'll, we'll move <laughs> we'll 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 fucking <laughs> <memories. laughs> I'll, I'll start twitching and stuff like that I'm thinking about it. <laughs> so Graham what was, your, what was your history about becoming a hip supporter was that something that ran in the family or yeah, it's. I've told the story a couple of times. I I was not a football fan to start with. Um, I think you know, obviously, there was just me and my brother in the house at the time. John, massive Hibs fan, growing up, played football, went at the games every weekend when he could with my dad, and I think it was that you know that sort of brother rivalry thing. And he's like, well, if he likes football, I didn't like football, and I couldn't play football, so I didn't have that um, in my life either. So I spent you know the first sort of twenty years of my life. No, I mean obviously Hibs, yes, was was always going to be was always going to be the team if anyone ever asked. But with regards to actually properly going to the game, it didn't it didn't happen till I think it was it must have been about nineteen ninety. So that's only about 32, 32 years ago or something. And and I'd maybe been a couple of games up until that point. And what happened was my dad was going to the game on his own. John was was living and working in London at that point, and I'd start working at fourth. And uh, fourth used to get uh, tickets for the for the the weird Toyota lounge in the main stand, and um, uh, one one of the one of the sales directors came up to me and says, "Look, he says you're a Hibs fan, Grant. He says do you, want, do you want to come to the match on Saturday?" And I was like, "Yeah, okay. I'll just, can I can I bring my dad?" And and I thought this is actually a really nice way of me getting time with my dad. I'd moved out of the house at that point. I was living in my flat in Marchmont, and um, 
I thought this might be quite nice to to do this and me take my dad for a change. You know, he used to go with my brother all those years before. So maybe for time for me to step on this, a nice way for us to get get. And within literally a game, two games, I was done and completely and utterly hooked. And um, and and it's and it's and I've never looked back. And and you know, every season since then, uh, I've been uh, as it, as many certainly home games as as a as a, as I possibly can. You know. Panto aside is the only time that I can't really go to the home games, so uh, so yeah, so I've gone with my dad every you know every year since, and um, yeah, it's and that was, and that was the story. But you know, my, my family story is you know obviously my dad uh, Hibbs Daft grew up in in Downfield in, in Dalry, so deepest darkest hearts territory. All his mates are Jambos, but before that, his dad. Uh, my granddad was born in, uh, and lived in Leith. And uh, in fact, my granddad lived in Bothell Street, which is just, you know, on the other side mm-hmm. of the, the bridge. And uh, my granddad lived in one of those flats when he was growing up and uh, then moved to, to Del Rye when, uh, when my dad was born. So my granddad took my dad to Hibs and uh, that was the sort of family tradition there. And funnily, when we won the... You know, when we won the Scottish Cup, it was my granddad that me and my dad were, were thinking of because he lived and and died and never and never saw that that happen. And um, yeah, so it all kind of all kind of came around like that. But that was the sort of family connection there. And my, my granddad went to the went to the school, which is which it's, it's now redeveloped into a, that sort of community hub that's in the car park at Easter Road. But that was mm. the school my granddad went to. So uh, yeah, it was always it was always always going to be Hibs. You mentioned. Uh... Uh, becoming hooked within a couple of games back in 1990. Was there any particular hooks that you remember? I don't. I, don't, I can't remember what you know what, what it did. I mean, not long after that, obviously we had the uh, the school cup uh, run and and everything like that. Keith Wright came to the club, and then I, I remember I remember getting really excited when Darren Jackson arrived. And you know, if you think back to the the players. That we we had there, you know, Murdo McLeod was 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 playing in that season as well, and you know, Burridge was was in goals, and Pat McGinley was playing, and Margaret, his wife, was sitting behind us shouting at the hat-trick <laughs> all, all the game. Uh, <laughs> but there were some great players, and you know, um, Kevin McAllister. Um, so yeah, there was a lot of good players. Michael O'Neill coming in in those sort of early nineties as well. And um, I can remember, funnily enough, Darren Jackson, I remember getting really excited when we signed him. I think he went some like nine or ten games without scoring a goal. And, you know, we thought we were, we'd were we signed this, you know, goal machine. And obviously, subsequently, he, he proved his worth. Mm. But I remember it was like week, game after game after game, and Darren Jackson hadn't scored. And I think we had a midweek game against Dundee United at Easter Road. And I went there. I goes, I bet you, I bet you, Dan Jackson gets his goal. And he got a penalty. I think he got a penalty, and that was his first goal uh, for Hibs. But I remember there was this long gap. You know, when strikers come in, and if they don't score a goal, it just goes on and on and on. Um, and that was um, that was an early memory. I remember with, with, with Darren Jackson, as known as a Christian Deutsch now. Yeah, exactly. Then he gets one and gets gets tons of them. Um, yeah. We had a, a conversation about nostalgia the other day, just when you were saying about the 90s being 30 odd years ago. And I think when we had that conversation, we agreed that the 90s was only about 10 years ago, Grant. Yeah, sorry, <laughs> <that's> exactly, <laughs> I, I, I don't think about the 1980s, it's 20 years back. Aye, aye, aye. aye that's about right. Um, so obviously, the Scottish Cup is the highlight of all highlights for um, for Hibs fans, and we'll probably kind of get you to uh, ask about your experiences as winning the Scottish Cup. Um, but outside of that, what would you say was your, your highlight of watching Hibs or being involved with Hibs if you were broadening that up a wee bit? Um, yeah, I mean, I've been I've been really lucky. I mean, I went to we had a pre season in, in Ireland, and I, and I went along with the club then. Um, I went to Dnipro with with the club as well. I was doing my I did my show from Athens. Um, when when Hibs played AK Athens the on the second week, you know, and I was on the plane with the players taking off, and obviously it was just after nine eleven, the day after nine eleven or whatever. And we got on the plane, and you know, a couple of flights had gone off before us with Hibs fans, and we were on the the, the team plane with the media, and we were up at the back with the journalists and and, and Big Graham, our, our engineer from Fourth, and uh, Mark Donaldson was with us, <clears throat> and we I remember we took off. At Edinburgh, I went right. We're going. This is it. We've taken off. We're going. And it was always like, 
Actually, no, the game's off, and then they had to turn around. So we literally took off, turned around, and landed again, and uh, we hadn't got our cases back. But we flew out the following week. So that that was that was fantastic, you know, just just traveling with the. Uh, uh, with the team like that and then you know doing my show from Athens and some of the Hibs fans came up we were on a rooftop um, with a pool up on the roof of the hotel that we were staying in um, a great night there and uh, but I think from from a from a game point of view you know I'm, I'm you know obviously there's, there's the Scottish Cup which we might as you say talk about uh, and there was the the 6-2 game but I still remember that AK Athens match and I, and I think that was the first time that the the atmosphere at Easter Road really went up a level. And I remember walking out to it. Um I was working in the in the in the in the hospitality beforehand, got everybody up to their seats as as it was approaching kickoff and I walked up and I just felt this noise and I just felt this atmosphere. And it did not relent. It didn't stop until, you know, we all went back down at the end of the game, scunnered obviously. Um, but that atmosphere, I know everyone's <clears throat> kind of puts up there and rightly so because it was just it was magic and you know we had that was a fantastic time as well mm. you know McLeish in charge and Sozzi and all that and doing Sozzi's dinner earlier this year um, was an absolute treat and a joy to do um, he was you know it's obviously been a long time since he's been back at East Road so finally for him to return and be at the uh, be at that dinner and for me to just sit beside him with Luke and the two of us and be in his company and he just held the room. It was, I don't know if any, any of you were there that night. No. But um, it was just, it was, there was one point throughout the evening, <clears throat> I'm sitting there, I've got my microphone, and would ask him a question. And Frank's just chatting away, telling how much he loves the Ibs and how, how much a beautiful time he had when he played at the East Road with these players. And I'm just sitting like that, <laughs> staring at him. Maybe how the same way I'm staring at you right now, because that playing tag time was. <laughs> Super. <laughs> <laughs> I did, he just he stopped speaking, and I was like, "Sorry, sorry, I'm just I'm just lost. I'm just I'm just lost in this vision of this beautiful man because he still looks exactly as he did 20 years ago. He's in great nick. He, I mean, you know, he's wearing skinny jeans and getting away with it. You, it's like, you want to wear skinny jeans? You wear skinny jeans, my friend. You can get away with. It. You're looking absolutely, you know, shit hot. And uh, yeah, so I, was, I had a bit of a. <laughs> a fanboy moment there, um, but yeah, those those were those were just nuts days. Those were great days um, with that sort of set up with McLeish. You know, the, the the downer from getting relegated, and then coming back that first game against Stranraer. Funnily enough, mm -hmm. in the first division, getting beat, and um, and then obviously going on to win it at a canter. But those were those were good days for me working at Hibs because think of this, right? I'd got this job. I'd, I'd been asked to do the job in hospitality. Uh, and that's another story. It's an interesting story how I actually got that job in the first place. But um, think think of that. I mean, I'm hanging out, right, with Pat Stanton, Laurie Riley, and Joe Baker every single week. We meet, and and I'm and like you know, I'm carrying my dad over the turnstile at this point. My dad's idol was Joe Baker, mm -hmm. and uh, for my dad to meet Joe Baker week in, week out, and to become a friend of Joe Baker, you know, on match days like he did, and Laurie Riley and Pat Stanton, uh, was, I think, I think the biggest, the biggest gift I could give to my dad through my, my work is is giving him that connection with Joe Baker because, you know, I talked about, you know, fanboy with Frank Sozzi there. My dad was a fanboy with, with, with Joe Baker uh, every single week. And um, he was an absolute gentleman, as was Laurie. And I got to be... Good friends with Laurie. It was it was a great privilege to speak at his funeral, um, and uh, that was. I mean, you know, God, that's, that's pinch me moment stuff. You know, for a Hibs fan, to, that's your that's watching your watching your team, and that's the company that you're keeping. I sat beside Pat Stanton when we won the Scottish Cup. You know, my, I've got Pat Stanton there and my dad there. Who, who did you hug when David Gray scored? Oh my dad! Oh my dad! Oh, it, was, it was my dad. Uh, Just touched uh, past Alan's ass. <laughs> <laughs> you know, Pat's, Pat's really and, and, and Laurie was was funny to sit beside of the football because we all sat together and uh, and watching these guys react for the game. And you would see, and Laurie, Laurie was a 
was was a very interesting to sit beside at the football because he was an absolute gentleman, uh, a real gentle man as well, very polite, very well spoken. His stories were fantastic, and you would sit beside him at the match and say, um, you know, and you would you would watch these Hibs <coughs> fans come in and sit beside him, and you'd introduce them to Laurie, and they'd all be like completely starstruck. I'm sitting beside Laurie Riley for the game today, and he would he would entertain every single one of them. He would spend time with them all throughout the whole afternoon. But see, for the 90 minutes of the game, it was almost like you got a wee insight to Laurie Riley, the player. Obviously, I, I never saw the great man play, but he would say, and it was, and it was all that, and it was all, all that. You know, that he wasn't, and <clears throat> same with Pat, not great for overtly celebrating when, when goals are scored. Um, it was more like a, mm -hmm. yeah, see that. yeah, yeah, that's okay. <laughs> um, but you could see he, he was clearly a tenacious terrier of a player uh, when he was out there and uh, you know you, you wouldn't have gotten any <clears throat> you know you wouldn't got much change out of uh, Laurie Riley if you're if you were trying to tackle him um and that was what that was great seeing that insight or just getting that wee little moment that little little you know insight into what he was like as, as a man on the pitch uh getting to sit beside him uh every game we, we got to see a bit of insight for Pakistan and the live show Hibs gave us we had a live show last year at the stadium and He'd done a wee interview before we started and we said, you don't have to hang about if you don't want to, as a load of shite. So as soon as he finished his bit, <laughs> he was away at the door. It's funny because I'd, I'd say to him, he says, uh, when, when do you want to do it? Because we could do the first part of the show, you can come on just before we do the interval or just at the start of the second half, or you could do it right at the start and if you want, you can just... So you didn't have to stick around, we'll not be offended because it is a load of shite, but we, we kind of positioned it. And I think he kind of just assessed the situation. He says, I'm not bored, can you just uh, bring one when you want? And then it was just before we were about to start, he says, actually, do you mind if I just go first? I think all the time, you, you, like, you go wherever you want. Aye. It's on your terms, no bother. He, he, he told a brilliant story about Joe Baker. When Joe Baker returned to Easter Road, when Joe Baker came back to Hibs after being away to, 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 to Reno, and Pat, by this time, had uh, moved into the, the first team, of course. Pat's in the in the changing room, and uh, in walks Joe Baker. And, of course, Pat is completely starstruck as well, you know, the return of, uh, you know, the Baker boy. This is amazing. <clears throat> and he says, i never forget it. He says, Joe Baker turns out, and he was immaculate, right? He was always a very, very well-dressed man. Uh, this immaculate linen suit. And he said he had this beautiful, beautiful um, plum sort of purple shirt the matching tie. And he says, and what I also noticed was his detail because he had a handkerchief in his top pocket, which was exactly the same as his shirt. And he says, I was just completely, you know, I'm just a boy for injuries. He says, I was just completely blown away by this, this style that was oozing out of this guy. <clears throat> so Joe Baker is, is getting uh, undressed. <clears throat> so he stands on the bench so he doesn't get his uh, trousers wet on the floor. So he's standing on the bench and he drops his drawers and he folds his beautiful linen trousers over a coat hanger and folds up. And as he turns around, he notices, Pat notices that there's a huge, big hole in the back of his shirt, which is like, that's, you know, I've just seen this beautiful, beautifully dressed man. All of a sudden, you've got this blooming great big hole in his shirt. And he goes, Joe, he says, what, uh, what's the story with the, with the shirt there? Why is, why is there a big hole there? And he just turned around to the jacket and he just pulled the lapel back uh, to the handkerchief. Because he'd obviously <laughs> turned the hole out of his tail of his shirt and turned it into a handkerchief and popped, popped it into his top pocket. And, uh, and that's what he'd done again. And, and Pat was like, this is just amazing to see how you know stylish he was. But that's what he'd done. The Edinburgh boy had still managed to cut out the <laughs> handkerchief out of his shirt tail so it would match exactly <clears throat> his shirt on the jacket. Yeah, Pat was in awe of Joe as well, Pat. Pat was, uh, it was funny, you know, I, you know obviously the, the sort of three times in Hibs history, Laurie, then Joe, and then Pat, but Pat was was just in awe of, of Joe and in awe of Laurie uh, as well. Brilliant. Brilliant to just sit and watch and listen to all these stories. Fantastic. That's fantastic. And considering you never started supporting Hibs till you were late on as well, eh? it's, uh... yeah, ah, I know, you, you start gold. I did, I did. And getting the job at Hibs, Again, that was through Radio Forth, and I'd been invited along with my dad. So I take my dad to, to hospitality. Mike Scott was the the commercial manager at Hibs, 
and he used to, we had a Contra deal, Hibs had a Contra deal with Radio 4th and it was all about advertising and so, you know, Hibs would get advertising on 4th and then 4th would get this corporate table to bring clients and, and, and advertisers to. So, of course, all the big games, uh, I would never get a look in. But, you know, if we're playing St Mirren or Kilmarnock, they'd say, Stotty, there's, there's two free seats if you want to come and bring your dad to the to the match. So me and my dad are at the game one day and Amanda Vitesse had just started uh, running the hospitality. And um, I don't know if you, if you any met Amanda, fantastic, uh, fantastic person to work with. And uh, she got up and she's she's a bit timid, right? She's not the most outgoing of, of individuals as is, is, is our Amanda. <clears throat> and um, so we were all sitting down and just getting to our seats and just over at the at the, the sort of hospitality MC area, there was wee Amanda. Her face was bright red and she had a wee sweat on and everything. And she was just holding the microphone, shaking, going, hello, everybody. If you would like to just sit down, welcome to Hibs. The catering team will look after you shortly. <laughs> right, she obviously hated, right, the any, <clears throat> you know, attention and having to get up and speak on the microphone. And so she comes over to our table and she goes, is this Radio Fourth table? And we're like, yeah, that's right. And she goes, do you know anybody who would like to stand up here and speak into the microphone before the games and read out the team sheets and interviews from the players? And I was like, yeah, I think, yes, <laughs> yeah, I think, I think I can do that. And I says, if I can bring my dad, I'll do it for the whole season. And that that was it. That's how it started. And uh, and and that's kind of how I actually went on to to do a lot more. Um, sporting events and, and, and dinners and corporate events and things like that because I was doing so much of the, the stuff at Easter Road um, and, and that was so it was just by luck again by chance that um, I was there at the right place at the right time and um, yeah so I started working with, with the hospitality team at that point and that's what I was saying that was <clears throat> Laurie, Pat and Joe were the, were the table hosts uh, in the lounge and uh, and that's how it sort of started so late 90s it must have been late 90s yeah how, uh, how easy is it or how difficult is it to do the hospitality stuff when things are bad? Like, I imagine it's easy when it was just like a big win, booty arts, whatever. But when, when it's been shit, how how do you kind of approach that? That was, yeah, they, they were, that was that was when you really, you know, earned your crust and, and learned how to do the job. Um, you know, it's all it's all right at sort of half past 12 if everybody's coming in before the game, everybody's in a good mood. It's Saturday afternoon, we're looking forward to the match. It's all great, so it's all nice. You know, a bit of chat on the microphone's all very lovely. But then if you go and get absolutely scunnered or if you go and get, you know, pumped in whatever the game is, and then you've got to go back there at five o'clock and go, um, right, hope you all had a good afternoon, <laughs> everyone. Um, and I would often feel even more sorry for the player of the year because one of the players would have to come up into the lounge and be interviewed uh, post-match and I've yet to find or yet to meet a footballer who enjoys coming up to the lounges and speaking on the microphone because it's again just talking about Amanda it's not everybody's cup of tea mm. not everybody enjoys getting up on a microphone and and I, invariably I find footballers don't particularly enjoy uh, doing it some just stick with it and get better like Lewis Stevenson you know I've probably interviewed him since he first started kicking a ball and I've seen it, you know, it became a bit of a thing. Oh, Lewis Stevenson's here. He's going to give us 10 minutes stand-up comedy. On you go, Lewis, on you go, pal. <laughs> and uh, he would he would dread it, you know, but he's got better at it by, by because he's had to do it. Um, but the, uh, yeah, I don't, I don't think many of the players particularly relished coming up to the lounge and that was always the worst, worst part of the job. It's because you still had to get up, you know. Uh, man of the match presentations had to be made, and you know, spon ball sponsors had to be get the photograph with a player. That was all, you know, that had to be done. Um, but yeah, that was when you kind of realise we're gonna have to work a wee bit here and try and, you know, make this as as bearable as possible. So, and, and so I, I quickly learnt, you know, the best way to do it is just speak as everybody's thinking. You know, don't try and go, well, that was a little bit unfortunate. We just got leathered 4 0 there. Sorry about that, ladies and gentlemen. Better luck next time, eh? Um, <laughs> that was never that was never gonna work. So you just had to sort of tackle it head on and be honest and say, not the greatest, try and get a bit of humor out of you know, the the, the circumstances that were there and uh, and then um and then wait for the player to arrive. But yeah, that was that was always the that was the worst part of the job. You know, I'd I can I'd be sitting there watching the game going, Oh, Post match is going to be brutal because <laughs> you know you can just see it come, you know, either a crap nil nil draw or 
you know, whatever. It's funny because um, we often talk about it on a Monday or a Sunday as we record now, but reading the room, like what's everybody thinking, hmm. blah, blah, blah. But you know, that's instant. So you've got it, it's, your, like, it's your opinion. So if you're thinking it wasn't as bad as everybody, you are actually reading the room, not just yeah. looking at message boards on Twitter to, no, to get you're it. Just, you're just walking, a, yeah. literally, you've got the time it takes you for, from getting to your yeah. seat to into the lounge or whatever, and then the room gets back and settled down, and then, right, there's your player of the year or, or your player of the year, your, your man of the match or whatever. Um, go and interview him. So you had, that's all you had time. So you basically, sometimes you'd, it would just be the people around you in the stand, you know, you're hearing what's yeah. going around you at that point, maybe get a bit of feedback for those that you're sitting at the table with, um, and then try and get a bit of chat out of it. But, um, yeah, it was it was, uh, it was tough. But great when it went well, though. Was yeah, there... But- Oh, sorry, my. Um, was there ever a game where you got up from your seat and you were heading back to the lounge and you thought, oh, I'm just going to keep walking. I don't know why I do this. I'm not going to do anyone. I couldn't do that, unfortunately. <laughs> I could not do that. Uh, that would have got me in a wee bit of bother. It would been very unprofessional of me. Um, oh, yeah. God, yeah, there was times. Oh, God, there was, there was times. No, you know, because especially when it's the atmosphere in the lounge as well, you know, if it's, if it's a derby. <sighs> You know, if it's a derby, there's, there's, there's invariably there's going to be a significant number of Hearts fans there, or Rangers fans, or Celtic fans in these big, big games as well. And it's like they're the they're the, they're the tough ones. And what about the to... the flip side of that question? Was there ever a time when you were desperate to get back and just kind of revel in the moment of a victory and the you know the conversation and chatting to a player, maybe the 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 match winning goal scorer, for example? Yeah, I mean, usually. Um... Uh, at the same games, you know, the, the, I remember let me try and get my, my again, my, my time's right here. We played Celtic towards the end of the season. Stephen Fletcher uh, scored first and, and we won 3 2. And the reason I know that is because I put a bet on for Stephen Fletcher to score first and Hibs to win 3 2. And uh, I won quite a significant amount of cash. <laughs> and that was the year I was going to my 40th birthday, with my mates, to Vegas. So it came in at a, a very good a very good time. Um, so, you know, as you can imagine, the lounge was absolutely bouncing and Stephen Fletcher came in as uh, as man of the match and, yeah, that was just one of those. That's when you want to get out there. That's when you want to get on because, you know, you, you, you don't even really need to say much because the atmosphere is going to be brilliant and you can just get a bit of reaction with, with the folk that are in the room and then when the player comes in, you let him, you know, you feed him the lines and you hope that they're going to come out with the nuggets that are going to get the place cheering and and say the right things, and um, yeah, yeah, the, the invariably to do. Scott Brown was brilliant. Scott was always, always entertaining, not mm. necessarily intentionally so, uh, but always, always entertaining. One time, I think it was, I think it was the St. Mirren game, and he had been getting, getting it tight. I'm sure it was of Jim Goodwin when Jim was playing for St. Mirren because he was a handful. Was 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 Jim Goodwin when he when he was a player, and the two of them, right, the two of them were going at it left right and there was one point where Jim Goodwin took Jim Brown clean out and I mean clean out and only got a booking or something like that so Scott Brown comes up as man of the match after the game and um, and of, of course we you know we're getting reaction to the, the result and I think we'd won and um, I'm saying there was there was a there was an interesting little moment halfway through the second half when uh, you were on the receiving end of a of a tackle he went aye he says, I'm just standing there, minding my own business, and then this <laughs> comes out of nowhere and takes me clean out. And I'm like, Scott, there's children and, and, and women present in the room. Would you please have to mind your, <laughs> mind your language? <laughs> there is this crystal clear. But that was Scott because he just told it as he saw it. And uh, and we got a nice, big, loud C-U-N-T uh, in the hospitality lounge uh, that afternoon, courtesy of Mr. Brown. But... Um, that's was that's what was brilliant about Scott because he too, you know, you're talking about just fresh from the game. You know, they've, they've, they've maybe only done a bit of press and then they've come to speak to us. And um, Scott gave it as he saw it, and uh, he was always, always, always um, uh, great material uh, post match. If we just uh, move on and take you to uh, we could mention that they would ask about the, the weekend of the Scottish Cup final. Grant, what was your uh, what was your weekend like that weekend? If you can remember. It was rather, it was rather excellent. <laughs> <laughs> uh, famously, it's my wife's birthday, the 21st of May. 
um, I'd organised a, a trip away for that birthday. We beat Dundee United in the semi-final and we're watching the highlights through there and Claire turns to me and she goes, oh, so that's you through the cup final um, against uh, Rangers or Celtic? I'm like, yes. And she goes, oh, it's on the 21st of May. She goes, that's my birthday. And she goes, are we not going away on that birthday? I went, um, we were. <laughs> uh, and thankfully she was very understanding. Um, so I, I, was, uh, I was working for Hibs. Uh, I hosted the... The lounge, they'd taken uh, about 500 Hibs fans on coaches from Easter Road and we took over the big lounge at Parkhead and we went there for uh, pre-match hospitality. And it was, again, one of those one of those days where your work is done for you. You just get up there and, you know, we had guests. Pat was there again. We had uh, Stuart Lovell was there. And Nick Colgan was there, I believe. And we had um, uh, yeah, various other past players were in the crowd, but they, these were the guys that had been interviewing pre-match, and uh, so we're at the at the hospitality, and I was speaking to Pat, and and and, and this this kind of stuck with me. And I remember it was a wee moment on the day when I kind of just went, actually, you know what? And we'd been talking about how previous cup finals, you know, they weren't necessarily level playing fields. Let's mm -hmm. just say when Hibs were going, and Hibs were massive underdogs in previous um, cup finals that we that we'd played in. But this one, playing Rangers, a team who we'd, we'd played quite a bit that season uh, in the championship and beaten, and we could beat them. And it was like one of these, it's like, we don't actually have to do anything particularly special in this game. We don't have to rely on any lady luck. We don't have to rely, you know, we just need to do what we've proven already this season that we can do. We can beat this this team without any, you know, last minute penalty or, or last minute corner um, <laughs> we can actually beat the team fair and square and it's like and it kind of dawned on me it's like actually we, we could do this without it being a massive shock you know obviously we're, we're still the underdog and and it was I remember that I just kind of went it kind of dawned on me as I was saying it to uh, to Pat and anyway obviously we then went on to Hamden and uh, and won the game and I mentioned about play uh, putting 3-2 on that uh, Celtic on that Celtic match. That was my that's my bet, right? I, I always bet on Hibs to win three two, and I have done for years. And, and my my theory behind it is it doesn't happen often, but it doesn't come in often. But my theory behind it is it's usually good odds, right? So if you put like a fiver on it or a tenner on it, you'll get a decent wee return on it. You will also have had a pretty good game. You know, there's there's going to be five goals. You've got three of them. So the chances are it'll have been quite an exciting match. And so for that to come up as a as a bet, so I've always done that. I've always bet Hibs 3-2, Hibs 3-2, Hibs 3-2. So we get to um, Hamden, and I'm like, oh, I'm not putting my 3-2 bet on. And Stuart Lovell was sitting beside us as well. And um, I, uh, and he goes, oh, I've got one. I've got an app. I've got an app. I can I can put the bet on for you. And I says, okay, I'll, I'll, get, I'll give you a tenner. And he goes, oh, he says, I've, I've broken my limit. He says, I can only put a pound on. I says, well, put a pound on Hibs to win. Three two. Oh, fuck, I wish I put a tenner on. <laughs> I wish. I wish I'd got my tenner that day. But no, you gave. I think. I think. I think. I think odds were like ten to one or something like that for three two or something ridiculous. Anyway, and he paid up straight away. Um. So uh, so yeah, we just went nuts, and I've got this picture of my dad. Um. Because you know we're all going crazy when when the when the goal went in. You know, there's that moment where we're all heads in our hands and going. What the f what what the f what is could this actually be happening? This 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 might actually finally and it was and and and, and I've seen it on different clips. You know, it wasn't just me that was doing that. Going, what? this this you know, fans all around me were doing it. And um, and then when the final whistle goes, I looked at my dad, and obviously we're we're going bananas, we're going nuts, we're going nuts, and then everything begins to kick off on the on the pitch. And then I just looked down, and my dad's sitting on the chair with his head in his hands and he's just having a wee moment to himself and you know if it's bedlam all around bedlam all around with Hibs fans and there's my dad just sitting so I got my phone I'm so glad I did I got my phone out snapped a couple of pictures of him and he was obviously just taking a wee minute and thinking of his dad and thinking because this was his seventh Scottish Cup final that my dad had been to and obviously six failures and the seventh the lovely that lovely number uh, worked out for him. So, yeah, I mean, up there, best, best day of your life. 
aside from you know kids being born and things like that. Um, but yeah, <laughs> we've disputed that in the past. Uh, we, we've had that conversation. <laughs> there. Well, I'm, I'm just, I'm just putting out there. In case the kids are <laughs> but uh, I mean, I'll never forget the, the, the day they were born. Um, but I will never forget. I will never forget the twenty first of May, uh, twenty sixteen. Um, and uh, lucky enough, because I've been working for the club that day at the hospitality, I was invited back to Easter Road. So I took my dad back to Easter Road because it was like, you know, we got the bus back into town and uh, we're walking down Easter Road. Walk, we got dropped off the top of Easter Road. I'm going, Dad, what do you want to do? Do you want to go up town or do you want to go Easter Road? And because there's going to be a reception, he goes, what, do, you, do, you think the, do you think the cup's coming back to you? I says, it's coming back to Easter Road tonight. So we're there, got in. <laughs> waited patiently and they just all came in. I remember big Darren McGregor coming in and just, I just ran up and hugged him. Right. I mean, if, if I had a ring in my pocket, I would have proposed. <laughs> uh, he's, such a big, he's such a big tidy. Um, and, and he goes, Oh, big man. He says, that meant a lot to you. And I was getting, I, I, I kind of was, I kind of was, I, I couldn't get the words out. Uh, and then, of course, the cup comes into the room, and my dad's like, oh, so he's got his wee camera, his wee digital camera. So we got photographs, and he got pictures where he borrowed somebody's medal and got a picture of all the players. And um, so I got all the book. For Father's Day that year, um, I put this book together and got all the photographs put into a book. Of, you know, took 70 years, but Les finally got there to see Hibs win the Scottish Cup and things. So that... As much as it was brilliant for me and, and the best day for, for, you know, watching football, watching Hibs um, in my life, but just that for my dad. That's, uh, that's there forever, you know. Nothing that's so bad. And it's funny, you know, I said, you know, I said um, we could win the Scottish Cup again, and we very nearly did, uh, let's, let's be honest, recently. And, of course, it would be magic, and, of course, it would be brilliant, but it will never, I don't think anything can top. And the way that we did it, the, mm. the teams that we beat on the way... The drama that unfolded at certain games and how we turned games around and took them to a replay. And, uh, yeah, it will it will never never be matched. Say we completed football that day. Yeah. Oh, so it'll, 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 it'll never be a... everything from a Hibs point of view, and if as a Hibs supporter, everything changed. Literally on a halfpenny. Literally on David Gray's napper. Everything changed. Songbooks were ripped up and thrown out and you know, all of a sudden, uh, the tides changed, and oh, it was it was brilliant. And you know, no matter what highs and lows come our way, we will, you know, and and, I, and I've been saying it since. You know, every day is the twenty first to me. If you just think of that moment, nothing will ever take that away. You can watch the clips on YouTube if you're feeling a wee bit low, a wee bit pissed off with your team, with your work, whatever. Just stick on. Get on YouTube and have a look, at, or get on um, Jim Matthews' DVD, open a bottle of wine and <sighs> really love it. Fucking love it. <laughs> Great advice, that. So it was in during lockdown. Remember during lockdown, they replayed it all. I sat and watched it all that yeah. day. The first yeah. day, twenty twenty. We did. I we did a watch along, didn't we? We had full joining in on Twitter, ah. so we we played it from three o'clock as and sort of did commentary through the game on over uh, Twitter and and relived the game. That, that was brilliant fun. And that can happen again because again, it was three two. We know, you know, obviously it was just packed with drama, packed with incident. Lots happened, <laughs> nerves, edgy, edgy of seat stuff, and we could do that. And I think was it was also somebody put out on social media if you start the game at such and such a time on Hogmanay, uh, and the back timed it. So if you start <laughs> <laughs> right time of the stroke of midnight, would be David Gray's goal <laughs> going in at the right time. It really, ah, um, oh, but yeah, it's oh, brilliant. Brilliant, brilliant, brilliant. Bit, nothing, bit, nothing will take that away for us. Better than the Hoot and Annie, anyway, isn't it? If you did that, but uh, <laughs> and I'm a big fan of the Hoot and Annie, but it's, it's still better. Um, <laughs> the um, the other thing we were going to ask you about. So you you've managed to get Hibs references into well, obviously the Panto is, is a big feature. You get like a, a couple of Hibs jokes in there, and and now yeah. on the River City. So how have you managed that? Is it in your contract or? Well, obviously, the, the, the obvious one is Panto, you know, doing that as long as I, as I have been. And then once Alan Stewart and Andy Gray found out about this 
you know, how many years has it been since Hibs won the Scottish Cup? Then that was clearly an in for them. So that was the that was the regular joke for them to have a wee pop at, at me um, about, uh, you know, Hibs not winning the Scottish Cup. And so I got that for years, right? And, of course, all the jambos in the audience absolutely lapped it all up. And I would try and get something back, but it was, it was such a biggie, you know, it was such a biggie to try and bat that yeah. one back over the over the net. It was it was it was really hard. Um, so so when it when it did happen and it panned till twenty sixteen, um, I'm like, right, I've got to, I've got to get this back. And I I, I managed uh, we, we we did this lip sync routine where we mimed to bits of songs to tell the story of a sketch or whatever, and. Uh, you know, they would both go off at the end. And I says, look, at the very end, I says, you got to leave me on my own. I go, well, if you can't beat them, join them. And the Proclaimers came on, I'm on my way. And I just put my hand into the wing and there was this replica of the Scottish Cup, which just gave me a wee moment to <laughs> give a wee bit of a dance. And the Hibs fans finally had their moment at the panto. And then at Christmas, on Christmas Eve, um, somebody for the club phoned me up and said, Grant, do you want, do you want us to bring the Scottish Cup in tonight? The actual cup we'll bring it in and you could take it on stage. And I'm like, oh, hi, hi, please. So they came in and we got it set up in my dressing room where it was all safe and secure. And instead of, and actually what I did, what I did was it says, you know, I, I, I got this sort of cardboard cut out the wee replica that we used. And then I said at the very, I says, clearly, clearly, I says, that's not the actual Scottish Cup. And I just put my hand into the other wing. I'm like, this is the actual <laughs> Scottish Cup, and uh, it went uh, it went mad. It was brilliant, brilliant. So that happened twice. We got Christmas Eve, and then we went again in in January when we uh, actually got the cup on stage at the Kings. Um, so that was great. And with you know, we've just continued that, and, and, and you know, there, there's always going to be, you know, I wrote a song. I was I was doing what were we doing, Goldilocks, and I was playing. Um, the character was called. Uh, Von Winkelbottom, right? And <laughs> and so this was my character, and this is the Panto character, right? Von Winkelbottom. And at the, at they'd written a song in the script, and it was a, a play on The Show Must Go On, which was this Freddie Mercury Queen song. And and the opening line was, Von Winkelbottom, I'm here to close the show, or whatever it was, right? And it wasn't, you know, I was just going, well, it's just a bit of a... It's just a panto song. There's not really much mm. going on in it. I says, can I rewrite it? And I went, I, okay. So I went away and rewrote it. And instead of opening up with Von Winkelbottom, I said, Paul Hecking Bottom, <laughs> he was shown the door. Right? So then I just I thought, right, that's the opening line. So it's all about Paul Hecking Bottom getting sacked. Because at the point that we opened the panto, Hibs and Hearts didn't have a manager. We'd sack, both sacked our managers. Uh, Craig Levine had just been bumped from Hearts. And obviously Hecking Bottom had been bullet from from us so so i'd rewritten it all about you know hibs didn't have a manager hearts didn't have a manager we pop at hearts uh and then midway through jack ross gets a job or shortly afterwards jack ross got the job so i had to write that in and then one saturday i think it was a saturday before christmas after the matinee went down turned the radio on and um uh, hearts had announced uh stendhal had got mm. the job as the the manager at Hearts, I'm like, what rhymes with Stendhal? Uh, how am I going to get that into this? So I had to rewrite the song before the evening show to obviously reflect that the the manager had changed. Um, but that that's that's part of it. And I, have, I, I get people turning up in Hearts tops and scarves, and they're sitting in the audience going, "It's not hey, get it right up you." Uh, and I'm going, "That's not bothering me. Nobody can see you. You're in the dark." Um, <laughs> but, but it's brilliant. I mean, I, I do love that, and I do love that's part of my you know, what I bring and, you know, if, if Hibs are flying high and I will take advantage of that. Likewise, if, if, if hearts are, then I'll get it thrown right at me from somebody else on the show. And that's part of it. And that, that's the, that's the joy of it. And, and, and people love that. And the football fans and the, and the Hibs and the hearts fans love it because they know it's just for them and they can, you know, they'll get whatever the jokes mm. are. You know, one time, one time Alan Stewart came on with this, Massive sort of fur coat and hat, um, as as the dame, and on all I needed to say was, "Oh look, it's Anne Budge." <laughs> right, that's all I said. <laughs> just, just uh, and of course, Alan doesn't have a clue what was who Anne Budge was, um, but uh, yeah, just oh, that's perfect. So just little little nuggets, they just place like that is great. And uh, and River City, 
Uh, well, this is this is one of the joyous things about getting that job. They they have written it uh, and written a character uh, around me. Is is what they said they've done. You know, so you know, I was a wee bit concerned about putting on a west west coast accent. He says, no, no, no. Sam Spiller is going to be from Edinburgh, and uh, we're going to make him a Hibs fan. Uh, and we says, and what we really like about this is because obviously it's set in, it's set through in the west, and so they rarely go down the footballing chat on, on storylines mm. there because for obvious reasons um but they think well if we're bringing in a hibs fan then yeah we can we can do that so th they've they brought me in as a hibs fan and they've clearly done the research because they, they, they wrote this fabulous scene where ian robertson who plays my son stevie and i'm trying to use football as a way of you know connecting with him and bonding with him and he's not interested in football at all and i'm saying well i can i can educate you so you say you know so it's all about it's all about the forward line. I'm going to show you the famous five, right? And I get the salt and, salt and pepper and the sauces. You've got Laurie Riley, Willie Ormond, you know, and just, and I'm trying, and, and they've written it all. It was not, not me, you know, it wasn't me that put it in, but they they wrote this little thing about me giving them a bit of history lesson about about Hibs and how magic the famous five were in the 50s. Now they changed the game forever. And um, <clears throat> so they, they really go for it. And, and there was a scene where I gave uh, Stevie a season ticket and the arts department at River City um, give you your props, right? They say, well, we've been away and, and, and made your um, uh, your season tickets. So that's one that you give to Stevie. That's the one that you keep. And so after we shot the scene, he says, oh, you can just keep them, by the way. I thought, oh, it's literally, I mean, I'm, I think I'm GG 15 and 16 in uh, GG 115, 116 in the, in the main stand. They're, they're in my dad's seats. And for some bizarre reason, it had HH 115, 116. Just by fluke, just by you know, I'm like, where'd you get those numbers? And he goes, oh, we just we just made them up. Just I said, that's like the seats behind me. <laughs> that's where we sit. <laughs> do, do you think they trust around. you as an actor, Grant? I'm just uh, <laughs> I'll, I'll just <laughs> that makes me easy for you. <laughs> yeah, they're making it brilliant. I mean, this is the thing. You know, it's, it's like you, I've, 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 you know, and when I say oh, I've got a job in River City, it's like, oh, oh really? What, what are you doing? I'm like, well, I'm playing a bit of a, a washed up has been for the 80s who loves Hibs and from Edinburgh. <laughs> kind of, I'm having to dig deep for this one. I'm <laughs> <laughs> um, so, yeah, no, it's, it's, it's brilliant that, they're, that, they're, that they've done this. And I think what's also interesting is, you know, the, the, they've got this two father thing that was going on with uh, uh, Andrew Campbell Baxter. Uh, or two soups, as a, as was as we've two called soups. them, uh, two <laughs> soups, and uh, even he he used the, he used the the sort of football thing as a as a way to have a wee pop at me, and I was, he's like, so I started watching one of the Edinburgh teams. I was like, oh, Hibs. He went, no, the other ones. You know, so it's, it's putting that in, and Jordan, who plays Alex Murdoch, his character, although Jordan is not, he's a big Rangers fan, um, but Alex Murdoch, his character is a Hearts fan, so. I think it's clear that there's going to be, and because of my relationship with Jordan, they're going to, at some point, put these two characters together with a wee football, Hibs and Hearts storyline. See the guy in Scott Squad? Aye. Jordan. Yeah. Aye. Aye. He's very good. Pan, Aye. There's Panto us in the Ember as well. Jordan's, mm. Jordan's fantastic, and I'm so pleased that I'm, I'm getting to work with him, not just uh, in Panto, but uh, at River City as well. It's uh, it's great. So, But uh, it's taken him all his acting skills to try and portray a a hearts fan because <laughs> he could have done what me the, the guy Stevie Purden is a big uh, Rangers fan but they made Bob a Celtic fan uh, and Scott Fletcher who plays uh, Bob's sidekick um, he's a he's a Celtic fan but they made him a Rangers supporter so they do this intentionally on the show just to stretch your acting <laughs> <laughs> so I'm quite fortunate that they made him a Hibs fan was it East, East Enders made up a team, didn't they? When uh, it was a Walford, they yeah, the they, they made up a team. Walford, you, you, you probably couldn't get away with that on the uh, in a in a Glasgow set yeah, soap opera, right. could you? Um, I just just because we're we're kind of out of time for the episode, Grant. So just um, what what are you your hopes and expectations for the season coming up? Like everybody else, um. Romantically optimistic, as always, I'm about Hibs, um, especially in close season. Once you get the pain of what's just gone before us, over and done with, you then begin to look forward and you get optimistic. Um, I think this is an interesting time for the club. I think I think uh, 
fans' patience uh, is 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 wearing thin. So I think this new management structure, players coming in, this I think this really has to work, and I think that has to work quite quickly. Um, because patience is, is is maybe running out a little bit, mm. um, given what we've we've gone through the last couple of years. Um, I you know the more I hear uh, about Lee Johnson, the more I, I begin to quite like him. I like the, what he's what he's talking about, what he's doing. I, I, I had a conversation with one of the guys that has it that that gave me a wee bit of insight as to how hard he worked for the interview, and that went that included going to see games off his own back before the, the interview. And I think one was even that bloody game at Dundee uh, mm -hmm. towards the end of the season in the piss and rain. And he sat through that and put together some really impressive notes and, and things. So, yeah, you know, it's... it's. I got really excited with Jack Ross, got really excited with Sean Maloney, um, thought this is, this, is, this is going to be great. This is all going to go. And obviously, th things don't work out. What we've seen, with certainly with, with Sean Maloney, is um, you don't get a lot of time. You know, you'll not get a lot of uh, <laughs> time to to make your to make your mistakes, and and if you do, you're going to have to you know make up for them very quickly. We've got Hearts second game of the season after St Johnston. Um, what a way to get the get the fans on side. Um, a couple of wins in your first couple of games um, will will start the season. We'd start the season well, I would say. So that's got to be the aim. Uh, of uh, of the of the new of the new team and the new or the new management team and and the new players coming in, they've got to have that drilled into them. And um, yeah, the, those first two games, I would say, you know, I know it's a, a new season, everything like that. But we've we've you know we, we want to get these two in the can and uh, with decent performances as well. Massive two games. Um, just before we wrap up, Colin, John, anything you want to to, to ask before we let Grant go? Hi, um, what did you get to rhyme with Stendhal in the end? <laughs> uh, I think it was Radio Rental. <laughs> Hearts fans were going then. Radio Rental. And then in came Baron von Stendhal. I think, that made, I think that's kind of how I made it work. <laughs> uh, yeah, so we'll see what I have to write about this year. But I'll wait till the, the football season starts before I start thinking of any Hibs and Hearts jokes. Uh, hopefully you've got some good uh, some good positive material to, to work sure. with. Fingers sure. crossed. Uh, yeah, sure. yeah, definitely. definitely. Um, all right, boys, listen, thank you for asking me on. Anything else? Before, before we're, 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 all, we're all good, Grant. We'll, we'll let you go. Thanks for uh, thanks for coming on and, and taking a bit of your Father's Day um, with three idiots. Uh, we, we, we do appreciate right. it. Um, if you subscribe, uh, you will hear me, Colin and John, uh, talk about more hip stuff in Long Bangers Extra Time. Um, you can subscribe at longbangers.hubwave.net. Uh, until then, we'll see you next time.